26 o'clock. So the next presentation is uh, psychiatry, about psychiatry. It's a word that often people are afraid of, and our presenter is going to try and uh, explain it. Boris Chomet. Good afternoon to you, doctor. You are a psychiatrist, and in your job, you meet a lot of families, and so you have noted a lot of different symptoms and therefore a lot of different treatments and responses. So please explain to the families listening what exactly psychiatry is all about and reassure them. So please uh, let's uh, listen to uh, the story that Dr. Boris Chomet has to tell. Thank you and thank you for hosting me here. It's great to be here. Uh, when people talk about psychiatric wards, people are generally quite afraid. And yesterday, there were three DDX3X patients I was counting over the last few years that I have. Uh, we have a former neuropsychologist who's here as well. And a lot of families wonder why psychiatry? Uh, my uh, child is not crazy, so why do I have to go to a psychiatrist? And we don't just look after people who are very severely ill uh, in psychiatry. We all have so deal with patients who have genetic uh, malfunctions and need psychiatric help. Oh. Because your accent is terrible, so I will. Je vais parler en français. Désolé. So uh, I've left a few slides in English so that you can follow more easily. Uh, and this is something that I borrow from uh, people who've carried out this study. So you have the study in France, the Genida study, and two other studies, former studies that have been published. And you can see that there are a lot of different disorders in this DDX3X, uh, uh, which is to do with neural uh, dysfunction. So intellectual disability is one of them. Uh, almost all patients have that to different degrees. Uh, coordination problems. So um, uh, lateness in speaking, uh, warning, uh, hyperphagia, uh, sleep problems, uh, autism disorders. Uh, that's a minority, I would say. Behavioral, uh, ADHD, and even epilepsy uh, or seizures. In, in St. Anne Hospital, we have neurosurgeons, uh, not just psychiatrists, uh, and we're familiar with all of these kind of problems. But what's interesting to note, and what was said this morning by Valentin, what you have fed back to us is the main problems, are the main problems. So behavioral problems uh, with uh, problems of uh, attention deficit. That's what most families um, say is uh, important. Now, I'm just going to go through this. I've tried to break down uh, brain cognition. I know that this might seem a little bit simple for those who are experts in the field, but let me just try and explain this. Brain cognition is very complex and it uh, includes various different functions. So there are things to do with memory and learning, language, the executive functions, how you plan an action. So if you need to go shopping, you prepare, you take your money, you shut the door, you take the bus, etc. Sequences that you plan in your mind. So they're called executive functions. Then we've got complex attention. Uh, so being able to focus your attention on something specifically and then being able to withdraw from that attention. Otherwise, you would stay stuck on it. So social cognition as well, how you understand emotions, how you interact with somebody else, how you know uh, that at one point you have to stop interacting because there's no point anymore and how you strike up a conversation or end a conversation and more uh, uh, functions around perception and uh, matricity. Uh, motor skills and these functions are difficult and so when you change one of those it can have an impact on the whole system and for genetic disorders uh, some very small uh, malfunction in one place can impact the whole system and let me just give you a few examples this is a kind of normal development it's in a kind of star shape we're going to try and use stars here you can see it's all fine everything is aligned everything is represented properly uh, as you would expect 
I, I don't like to use the word normal, um, but obviously that is the underlying message. It's optimal functioning. Now, if something is uh, different, for instance, memory and learning, then you have a deficiency in this field. So problems reading, problems learning to write, to count, or your visual spatial orientation, geometry. It could be any of these. Everything else is working uh, and there's no, there are no other problems. But this is what we call the deficiency, learning deficiency or disorder. And we have to do cognitive training or remediation to try and boost that function. And it's useful to use this star because it means we can use maybe another function to rehabilitate the disorder. So for instance, when you say that you have a memory problem, maybe we can use a strategy uh, from the executive functions to consolidate that memory. And that's exactly what colleagues do that do that uh, remediation. They try and see where the strong points and the weak points are, and they use the strong points to improve the weak points. So isn't that amazing? You're using a different pathway than the the, the brain would have, but you are still trying to get to the same result. So for instance, here, we've got a motor disorder. So that is uh, gives rise to dyspraxia. Uh, children who sometimes are not very well coordinated tend to bump into things, or it could be more finely tuned problems. Uh, we were talking about learning to tie your laces this morning. That is something that we can offer in uh, therapy uh, to help with uh, trying to improve that dyspraxia because those uh, fine-tuned uh, things are quite useful. For instance, writing as well. It could be something that affects writing. Now, the kind of therapy we would use here is motor therapy, mainly, to try and improve that motor function. But another example here, you might have a speech disorder. Now, this is a bit more difficult to identify and it's tied in with a general lower cognitive function level. Why? Because a lot of the tests that we run are use language. We try and get the person to remember the names of objects and then to recite them. If they have problems speaking, then it will be difficult to assess their memory in this way, won't it? So unfortunately, speech problems or language problems are badly diagnosed and people will tend to think that they have intellectual deficiency. However, it's just the actual speech part that has a problem. And as we heard from Angela Morgan, language is a very difficult thing for uh, DDX3X. So often that means we tend to downplay uh, the intelligence of people affected by this disorder because we don't have the right kinds of tests. And there are other kinds of tests as well. We've got the Vexler scale to measure uh, uh, intelligence, and we've got nonverbal scales as well, uh, where we try and assess it without using language. It's not so intuitive, it's not so well known as all of the other assessments that we make in neuropsychology. Now, learning, uh, improving speech uh, go goes through a speech therapist, of course, uh, and it's very hard to find somebody, uh, a professional who has slots available. But there may be various different fields that are affected, language maybe, and your motor skills. And there you would have to use two therapists. And that's what you're seeing with your kids. Sometimes you know that they have several problems. And so they have a sessions, therapy sessions uh, throughout the week. And that's why they're so busy, because you have to try and boost all of the different skills. And then, of course, again, this is the star, but it's a smaller star. And that's what we call intellectual disability. So you have capacities, but they are just lower in all domains, in all fields. That's more difficult to deal with because you need to try and draw on the different strengths to improve the system. And it's very difficult, it has to be said, to deal with these patients and to improve them. They don't benefit from any specific therapy. You just need to have uh, different approaches, improve language, improve the motor skills. But it's very difficult to try and get that star to enlarge. But now I want to focus on uh, 
social cognition. Some patients were identified as having autistic traits with the DDX3X syndrome. And autism is, uh, you know, when you have a higher intellectual level than what would be expected. So here, yes, there is intellectual disability, but there's also other kinds of disabilities. When we're dealing with autism, everything is working except for social cognition. So that is the bit that has the disorder. And that's why sometimes uh, it's it's we use the word autism a little bit too easily. I mean, yes, it means that you can get funding sometimes or get on a medical pathway that will then help you. Um, that's all well and good. But actually, uh, autism is about social cognition, where it's the level of that is lower than what you would expect uh, for a generally function, functioning adult or a human. And we have to do social skills training to remedy this. So there are two stages. We have to, first of all, make sure that the patient understands their emotions and other people's emotions. That's the basic thing, because if they don't, <laughs> then you can't work on that relationship. <clears throat> Sorry, but then we have to use techniques to try and help them um, enter into a relationship with someone, identify whether that relationship is good or bad, etc. And that is the main problem, especially during teenage years. Now, what are autism spectrum disorders? Well, the definitions have completely changed. So it seems today that there are a lot more people being diagnosed as autistic as before. It's simply because the criteria have changed. But basically, you need disorders in uh, communication and social interaction. That's what's at the top of the slide. And also in the restricted and repetitive uh, characteristics uh, of behavior and interest. People who are kind of uh, focus on one thing, become obsessed or uh, impacted by a noise, one specific noise, for instance, uh, the subway or something. And you've also got a uh, a hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity. You might be very uh, sensitive to the light, to noise, or not at all. And that's difficult to notice because if you put somebody in a very noisy atmosphere, it might be so problematic that it might engender disorders that are sensory disorders. And that's very important when you're assessing these patients to, of course, do a neuro and psychological assessment, but also a sensory profile, because what we're looking for is to see how they react to the environment so that we can then adapt the environment. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that, although we're talking about DDX3X, there are boys affected, but it's mostly girls who are affected by the syndrome. And girls are special because they can actually hide a camouflage. In, we call it camouflage in both French and English. It means that it's difficult to spot girls who have autistic light like disorders. Usually girls tend to blend into the environment and they uh, can hide the symptoms. Boys are not quite so good at doing it. So girls can actually uh, hide it and cheat. And this kind of uh, autism-like uh, disorder can be um, misdiagnosed. And, you know, uh, like the lady who said earlier, the doctor said to her, your daughter cannot be autistic because she has a good eye contact. Well, that's exactly what I mean. Sometimes uh, it is acceptable to look people in the eyes, uh, and therefore she has learned it. It wasn't automatic. She has learned that when she talks to people, she has to make eye contact, except that if you look more closely, probably she doesn't, you know, keep her gaze focused uh, during the whole conversation. But there are people who don't know about this, uh, and therefore there can be misdiagnosed cases. And all the people who you meet will be trained in the old school. Autistic patients do not talk. They swing. They bite their own fingers. I mean, they've actually been trained with a single side of the autism spectrum. But it's a wide spectrum. There are various kinds of manifestations. There are people who actually teach in university, and yet they have autistic issues. So that's why it's very important that we see the evolution and uh, understand why we still make uh, go wrong in the diagnosis. Earlier, we talked about hyperactivity, but there will be a presentation later, but it's mostly uh, about uh, attention functions. And when we talk about hyperactivity, or it's the ADHD in English, 
it's a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Sometimes people simply suffer from a, uh, an attention deficit. They're not hyperactive. They don't um, jiggle under a chair. They don't jump around the place. No, no, no. They simply have an attention disorder. And if that is not recognized and monitored, it may lead to a number of other problems because attention is absolutely essential if you want to learn something. Very often when we miss the uh, attention deficit, we don't help the patient make progress. And that is something that will be managed by uh, with pharmacological treatments. I'm not in favor of pharmacological treatments for the sake of it, but sometimes we need them. And there are so there are psychostimulating drugs that work really well. And if they're well administered, there will be no major adverse events to fear. So sometimes you have to bear in mind that this dimension can be addressed. Now. Are you familiar with a famous person who suffered from attention deficit without hyperactivity disorders? I'm sure you know who I'm referring to. A clue. Somebody who also suffers from hyperphagia. Somebody raised their hand? No. Okay. We need a poo. If you look at the cartoons, you will see that Winnie the Pooh can be distracted really easily. I watched the cartoon yesterday, and uh, Winnie the Pooh was uh, preparing a Christmas, and his friend Piglet helped uh, him, and he wanted to hide the present, and so he went around the house to find a place to hide the present and hid it in an empty uh, honey jar. And uh, there was a full honey jar next to it, so he ate from the uh, full honey jar, and he forgot that his friend was there, so he continued eating the, 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 the honey from the uh, honey jar. He's not hyperactive, but he very often uh, can be distracted, goes to a different room, doesn't remember what he came to that room for. And if, it can be normal, but sometimes it reaches a stage where it can be really disruptive in everyday life. Now, this Winnie the Pooh story is really interesting. Because all the animals in the 100 acre woods suffer from psychiatric disorders. I mean, I didn't make it up. It's been actually published in the Canadian Psychiatry Journal, a scientific publication uh, recognized uh, and uh, complying with the scientific standards. And someone invented a test. I mean, I don't take this for a real diagnostic test, but it's rather interesting. You can try it online. I did not want you to see uh, my profile, so I just answered that random. But uh, Winnie the Pooh has an attention disorder, attention deficit disorder. Piglet as it suffers from anxiety. Tigger is hyperactive. He jumps all over the place. Rabbit, I can't remember the name, is uh, compulsive, uh, has compulsive perception uh, disorders. He likes to have everything tidy. You know, there are children who want everything to be really tidy and you place every object in a very determined place. And if you move them around, they'll be upset. The uh, the child, uh, uh, the Roo, Roo, the kangaroo, is still in his mother's womb and uh, is next to autism. But the worst one is um, Ior because he's depressed. The uh, the donkey is always uh, with the, um, his uh, ears hanging low, looking forlorn. And finally, the light is a child. I mean, it's not perfect. The child suffers from schizophrenia. It's not perfect. Uh, Oh, schizophrenia might be a bit exaggerated, but all the other features are can be observed in ADDX3 uh, children. And all these people in the 100 acre wood, in spite of their disorders, live in perfect harmony. The 100 acre wood is perfectly inclusive. Uh, everybody lives in harmony. They're all suffering from some kind of disorder, but they live together. It's a good example of tolerance. Psychiatric comorbid comorbidities. And this is also true for the uh, DDX3X uh, syndrome, anxiety. There are different kinds of uh, anxiety features, social anxiety, generalized anxiety. Obviously, social anxiety can uh, disrupt interaction. Separation anxiety, that's something you observe. You take a child to school and they will roll on the floor crying and they don't want to be separated from their parents. There is obsessive compulsive disorder children who will simply count uh, letters or uh, figures. Uh, there is uh, phobia. Children can be um, afraid of uh, dogs or horses. Every time they see a dog in the, in the street, they'll simply roll on the pavement. 
um, raises questions for their monitoring and management. And anxiety is very close to depression. It uses the same uh, biological pathways. When depression is present, there are also anxiety phenomena observed. And depression is defined quite simply by sadness and or and or loss of the ability to feel pleasure. Some people can be depressed, but not necessarily feel sad. They like to go out and see friends. They no longer want to go out and see friends, talk to friends, but they're not necessarily sad. But that could be a sign of depression, not wanting to go out anymore. There are other features, such as changes in sleep or appetite habits. One way or another, actually, it, you could... Uh, Appetite could increase and sleep uh, could decrease or the other way around. People are also tired, they uh, are slow. And again, the question is, is that depression or can it be part of the natural history of a, um, a genetic disorder? People who suffer from the syndrome may be more tired than the general population, but when that fatigue becomes intense, then you have to start asking questions. Finally, there's one thing that is often disregarded irritability. Some patients are extremely irritable, very tense, very aggressive due to depression. There are paracetamol tests with, uh, with patients. If someone has trouble expressing the symptoms but has pain, aches in the belly or elsewhere, they can become very irritable with the first person they come across. So one test in psychosocial uh, centers consists in giving the patient paracetamol. And if that relieves the pain, then you can see what the real problem is. And somebody who's depressed, has psychiatric disorders, cannot express emotions, may become agitated simply because of this psychic suffering that cannot be expressed properly. And that uh, causes anxiety. And finally, that also leads to attention disorders because people are focused on their thoughts and their sadness, and they don't focus on other people and everything else. Treatment, psychotherapy for light to moderate forms, except that psychotherapy with people who have trouble speaking may be a bit tricky. So we can also resort to uh, pharmacological uh, treatments. They do scare us, but sometimes they're, they're good. Well, avoid benzodiazepines. If you go to your GP and say, I am depressed, they will put you on, G on benzodiazepines, but not, that is not the right strategy. Because yes, benzodiazepines will relieve anxiety, but then the patient will become dependent uh, on uh, benzodiazepines and it will be necessary to decrease, uh, de-escalate the doses uh, progressively. And sometimes it will make people even more nervous. So stay away from benzodiazepines when possible. But there are antidepressant drugs. And even though the patient may not suffer from depression as such, the antidepressant drugs can be extremely useful. We used it on DDX3X patients with very good um, results and no uh, adverse events. For instance, uh, sertraline can be used in young children and it does decrease anxiety, decrease st the stress level and does not induce any uh, adverse events or no, no notable adverse events. And if they do appear, then we can discontinue the treatment anyway. Very often we grope in the dark and we don't know exactly what to do. I mean, let's call it that way. We're lost and uh, people try uh, new treatments and then they have to turn back. But, you know, if you turn back, okay, fine. There are no consequences anywhere on the long term. Now, something about transition from childhood to adulthood, a very important time, which may actually disrupt the, 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 the patient's management. Because when you move from childhood to adulthood, adults are not managed exactly the same way. Pediatricians look for after children, but there are no doctors, adult doctors. And so the patient will have to see a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist. There will be many different people taking care of the same person. You know, transition is always important. Transition is the time when anxiety and depression usually appear around the ages between 15 and 25. When you let go of the child's hand to allow the child to walk into adulthood, many abnormalities may appear, psychiatric disorders may appear at that time. It's also a time when people are vulnerable, socially speaking, because they meet other people the same age, maybe they may have one they may love someone else they may have a sexual 
impulses and you know you have to look at uh, how to make friends and social media how do you protect them from the social media and there is also the economic vulnerability until then you de depended on your parents but then when you become an adult you will receive um, uh, subsidies from the government from social services but then you will start thinking about maybe work and work in a special institution where the parents will let go of you and will allow you to become integrated in a new group of people with special educators uh, caring for you so it's an, a very vulnerable period there's medical vulnerability there's social vulnerability and there's economic vulnerability and that happens so all at the same time i'll give you two examples two programs we have developed in Paris. Thanks to uh, Charlotte Dansette and Evanderia Valadier, Valadier, but there are other uh, colleagues also helping. And there are neuropsychologists, psychologists being trained with these two programs. The first one is a program to support patients and allow them to acquire greater autonomy. We explain to them, okay, you have a disease, this is the disease, these are the symptoms. And then from then on, we have to set a target to move into adulthood. And so the patient's target will be, okay, now I have to be able to take my medication on my own without my parents who remind me. Because once I move out from my parents' house, then I'll have to be able to take my medication alone. So you try and help the patient self-determine in. And the latest program uh, is the Pierce program. It's uh, You can find it in the States. It's actually coming from California. The idea is to help the patient develop social skills so that uh, he or she may become integrated in a group with uh, people of the same age. Children, between uh, teenagers between the ages of 13 and 18, they can make friends. They discover what it means to have a friend, a good friend, and not a bad one. And uh, this also is based on the fact that they suffer from a rare genetic condition. You have to say the word or not say the word. You know, yeah, they have to learn whether to tell people they suffer from a rare genetic condition. And uh, sometimes we say you shouldn't, you shouldn't talk about that. But now, if they want to marry and have children, they have to tell the, 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 the person they want to marry that they suffer from a rare genetic condition. These are the skills that we need to help them develop. And therefore, we reinforce the, uh, the, the, the ring in the chain to avoid the chain breaking. And the family, we also have to help the family, help the parents, especially you following uh, the meeting on Zoom. Take care of yourselves. Uh, there are people who took an airplane to come to this conference. In, you know, in the airplane, they say in case of uh, the cabin becoming depressurized, uh, you need to take the air mask and put it on your face. But you should uh, put your mask on first before helping other people put on their mask. But that's exactly the same thing. We have to help the parents so that the help parents can help their children. We're not talking about running a, uh, a 100-meter race. It's a marathon. Parents have to be there throughout their children's life. And so they have to take care of themselves. They have to also take it in turns. Maybe one parent uh, will take a rest while the other parent is caring for the child, or maybe the grandparents can also help and give you some space, or educators uh, and specialists can also help you uh, take a moment for yourself. No one, and don't feel guilty. It's very difficult for a parent to be the parent of a child suffering from this kind of disease. You feel guilty if it's an ex novo mutation. It's not your fault. It just happens. You're not, it's not your fault. You shouldn't feel guilty. And finally, there is one last message. We have set up a very special um, interviews uh, during which uh, the parents will learn to look after themselves to be able to look after their children. This is a map of France. Uh, I don't have the, the, the globe, but I have France. And if people contact us, we will find uh, correspondents uh, across the territory because we have many different people here. So this is the map of France with the uh, reference and uh, uh, specialized centers. Uh, there, there are several across the, uh, the French territory. So if you don't know the addresses, send us an email. You have the email address at the bottom of the slide. You can uh, We can either organize um, online meetings or, and we can also give you the address of somebody in, in your neighborhood that will help you. But again, the message is take care of yourself so you can take care of your children. Don't be afraid of psychiatric specialists. It's better to see them early for no reason rather than uh, waiting until it's too late. Well, thank you very much, Boris Chomet. It was uh, very 
very 